Good morning, Ritman Grace. How are we doing today? Hope everybody's having a good weekend so far. Uh, my name is Clark. I'm one of the pastors here. And if we've never met, love to meet you. I'd love to meet your family afterwards. So feel free to, to stick around, like Julie said. Um, and also, if we have met, I'd love to just catch up with you and see how everything's going in your world. Well, we're going to be continuing in a series that we started a few weeks back on the Ten Commandments. And uh, last week, if you are here, you might remember we had some missionaries come and kind of share what God is doing in and through them in uh, Colombia. So uh, if you missed that, you can go back and catch that on our website. Uh, but I want to recap a little bit since last week we kind of hit pause on our current uh, series in Exodus 20. So a quick recap a little bit. Uh, week one, when we started this series, we actually didn't dive right into the Ten Commandments. We did a little bit of an introduction and looked at uh, nine misconceptions about uh, the Ten Commandments. And we also mentioned that uh, these commandments are not restraining. Uh, they're not constraining. They're actually freeing. They're liberating. They're given by a God who liberated his people Israel and actually liberates Christ followers today through the uh, conquering of Satan, sin, and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. We said that when we look at the Ten Commandments, I thought this was helpful for me and I thought it'd be helpful for you too. Uh, think of three different pictures of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, we said in our introduction, is that they are a map to us. They're a map in the sense that they show us the life that God intends us to walk in, uh, the path that we ought to be conforming to if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. So they, they act as a map, but they also serve as sort of a muzzle, as funny as that sounds. If you think of a muzzle on a dog, um, the Ten Commandments, they serve as a muzzle because they restrain human wickedness. And then thirdly, we said another picture of the Ten Commandments is they, they operate a lot like a mirror, right? And I think we all understand how a mirror works. We stand in front of the mirror so that we can see things that we need to change in our lives. So the more we stare into the mirror of, law, of the law of God, we said the more we see our need for Christ. So that's kind of what we said at the beginning of this whole study in the Ten Commandments. Uh, week two, we jumped into the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And so today... We're going to pick it back up in week three, the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. And if that sounds confusing to you, that's okay. We're going to explain that. But we're going to pick it back up. Uh, the second commandment in Exodus chapter 20. I like to think of it this way. The first commandment is about worshiping the right God. The second commandment is about worshiping the right God in the right way. Here's another way to say it. God cares about who we worship, and God cares about how we worship. Or you could actually uh, think about it another way. There's two different kinds of idolatry. Uh, there's worshiping other gods, and that's what we talked about a couple weeks ago, taking a good thing in our life, taking something good and making it an ultimate thing above God. But there's also worshiping the right God, with in the wrong way. And that's actually what the second commandment deals with. So let's look at the second commandment together, talk about that a little bit. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 20, and we're going to read verses 4 to 6, which says this, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them, or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So we read in the uh, second commandments that we just looked at, uh, we see what that is, but now I want to do a little bit of an exercise with you here this morning so that you can uh, understand on, in a more deeper level what the second commandment has to do with Okay, so here's the mental exercise I want to invite you to do with me. I'm going to ask you to, to do something with me here this morning. And first of all, this is going to sound really silly, but I want you to think of a unicorn. All right, you have that picture in your mind? Think about a unicorn. Okay, now think about the Statue of Liberty now. Now think about the Sahara Desert. Okay, now I want you to think about God. Now, whatever just came into your mind when I said, think about God, 
That is what the second commandment has to do with. When I say think about the Statue of Liberty, you're probably forming in your mind some sort of mental image of the Statue of Liberty. Whether that's a, a picture that you've seen, or perhaps you've been there, or maybe it's what you've kind of sort of imagined the Statue of Liberty to be like, or maybe it's some concept related to the Statue of Liberty. Uh, the bottom line is this. It's something is happening in your mind, conceiving of that mental image. The second commandment has to do with what we conceive God to be like. Uh, when somebody says God, what is the mental picture, what is the mental image that comes into your mind? I wonder if you've ever thought of that as so important that it makes the top ten things that God is concerned about. Why would that be the case? Well, I want C.S. Lewis to let us know why this is such a big deal this morning. Uh, one of the most famous works of C.S. Lewis was the Screw Tape Letters. And what it is, is somewhat of an imaginative allegory. Uh, and it imagines a master demon who is discipling or mentoring a younger and more novice demon at how to tempt a Christian and cause that Christian to turn away from God. And so you need to know that, you need to know that as I read this, because everything's kind of upside down when you read this. Uh, this is what you're not supposed to do, Okay. Um, and that's because a demon is telling another demon how to tempt a Christian. And so it can be very confusing if you don't see that. <laughs> you might be like, what's up with that quote? So this is a work of fiction. It's creative. So listen how this master demon explains to this younger demon how to tempt this Christian. So here's, here's what it says. The humans do not start from that direct perception of God, which we unhappily cannot avoid. If you look into your patient's mind when he is praying, if you examine the object to which he is attending, you will find that it is a composite object containing many quite ridiculous ingredients. I've known cases where what the patient called his God was actually located up and to the left at the corner of his bedroom ceiling, or inside his own head, or in a crucifix on the wall. But whatever the nature of the composite object, you must keep him praying to it, to the thing that he has made, not, excuse me, not to the person who has made him. For if he ever consciously directs his prayers, not to what I think thou art, but to what thou knowest thyself to be, our situation is desperate. Once all his thoughts and images have been flung aside, or if retained, retained with a full recognition of their merely subjective nature, and the man trusts himself to the completely real, external, invisible presence there with him in the room, and never knowable by him as he is known by it. Why? Then it is that the incalculable may occur. So you see what C.S. Lewis is saying. He's saying a lot of things, but what he's getting at is that there's the real God, completely real, external, invisible, and never knowable by us in the same way that we are known by him. And then there are images, these ideas that we have about God. Uh, Uncle Screwtape, is, what he's saying is, if you can get a Christian praying to his idea of God instead of the real God, then that's a win for Satan. And this is why the second commandment matters. Because idolatry begins in the mind. And here's what another great Christian leader says, A.W. Tozer. Listen to what he says. He says, Let us beware, lest we in our pride accept the erroneous notion that idolatry consists only in kneeling before visible objects of adoration, and that civilized people are therefore free from it. The essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. It begins in the mind and may be present where no overt act of worship has taken place. So here's the question for us this morning. What is God like? How do, we, how do you know what God is like? Where did you get your idea of God? Is it accurate? Is it true? Is it God's idea of God? That's the essence of the question of the second commandment. 
If you want to know what breaking the second commandment looks like, it looks sort of like this. It's, it's basically saying, someone might say, I could not worship a God who sends people to hell. It's saying something like, I could not worship a God who predestines some people to salvation. It's saying, I cannot worship a God who cannot forgive sin without the atonement of the cross. In each of those cases, what people have done is they, to take apart a biblical material about God and to fill it out in accordance with their own imagination of what that must mean and what the implications of that must be. And then decide based on that idea that God is not worthy of worship. But can't you see what's happening when you do that? That's the very nature of idolatry. That's us making God in our image. Rarely will you ever meet somebody with those kinds of objections who has actually done the work of understanding the biblical doctrine of hell in its fullness. Understanding the biblical doctrine of predestination in its fullness. Or the biblical doctrine of atonement in its fullness. Rather, usually what most of us do is we create a composite picture of God based on our own ideas or what we've heard about God or what people have said about God. And then we project that onto God and then we say, well, I'm not sure if that God is worth worshiping. And well, of course he's not because that's not the real God. And then let me just say this. If you're here this morning or watching online and you're investigating the truths of Jesus, the truths of Christianity, we would love to dialogue with you in a conversation because that's really something we're passionate about here. But if you're going to reject God, let me just say this, if you're going to reject God, I at least want you to reject the real God. Let's at least do the work to figure out who is this God that desires your worship. And if you reject him based on that reality, then okay. But don't reject a false, incomplete, inaccurate version of God and think that you're rejecting God. So, to break the second commandment is to impose our ideas about God onto God. To keep the second commandment is to submit to God's revelation of himself how do we know what God is like? How do we develop accurate images, conceptions, and ideas of God? I think the answer is we listen to how God has revealed himself. We pay attention to what God has said that he is like. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. I want us to see today that God reveals himself to us in two primary ways. The first way is this. God has revealed himself to us through his word. God has revealed himself to us through his word. Uh, think about this with me. We live in a relentlessly image-driven culture, don't we? We have televisions in our living rooms, and we have touch screens in our cars. We have smartphones in our pockets. Everything in our lives is visual. And in the midst of that, God says to us, you are to reject any and all attempts to represent me visually. Instead, you are to know me through my word. Why? I mean, let's just be honest. Doesn't that make it kind of hard? <laughs> don't you wish sometimes, maybe this is just me, but... Don't you wish sometimes, instead of giving you a Bible, God had given you a documentary to watch? Doesn't it seem like that might be a little bit easier? Why would God say, I don't want you to represent me through an image, because I want you to, represent, I want you to know me through my word? Well, here's why. Because only words are sufficient to reveal what is immaterial, infinite, invisible, and immortal. God cannot be adequately represented by anything that exists in creation because he is beyond all that. He is above it all. He created it all. And none of it adequately represents him. So how do, we, how do our minds form concepts of God, of a God that's immaterial 
And I think the answer is quite simple. It's through words. It's through words. Let me give you an example. This is another kind of fun exercise. Think about the number one. This is kind of silly, but think about the number one. Where can you take me in the world to show me the number one? You could show me a printed number one on a page. That's a representation of the number one. But where do you actually find the number one? And you go, you're weird, man. What are you talking about? As you reflect on the number one, here's what you realize. You've never seen the number one, but you've seen it on a page. You've seen it on a screen. But all that is a signifier that represents to you this concept called oneness or singularity. Like to say that in a room there is one pulpit, there is one stage, it's an abstract idea that your mind can understand, even though you cannot show me anywhere in the created world the number one. And that's why mathematics reveals God in ways that we need. See, God is a similar concept. God is universal. God is immaterial. God is spiritual. He cannot be represented by anything concrete, yet at the same time, we can know him. That's crazy. The same way we can know the number one or the concept of peace or the idea of justice. We can know these things because God has wired our minds to think abstractly and to conceive of reality. But for our minds to do that, we need words. So we keep the second commandment by humbling ourselves under the word of God and by seeking to know God through his word. And this is why the word of God is the centerpiece of Christian worship. This is why every Sunday we gather together here at Ritman Grace, and you'll notice that the songs that we sing in this church, they're not poppy love songs to Jesus, but they're rather songs whose content come directly from the pages of Scripture. They're rooted in God's Word. And you'll notice that every week we have the Word read aloud, just like we did earlier. We have a Scripture reading. We're hearing from the Word of God. We're hearing from the Word of God being preached and the word is grounded, excuse me, the worship is grounded in the word of God. Why is that? Because this is what God requires of us in the second commandment. And this is what it requires our mind to form a concept of God that is true and that is accurate. And so the question is this, do you love, do you treasure, do you revere the word of God? Are you thankful that God has revealed himself in his word? I think we ought to be thankful and grateful for the Word of God because that is how God has chosen to reveal Himself to us. So God reveals Himself to us in two primary ways. The first way is God has revealed Himself to us through His Word. And the second way God has revealed Himself to us is through His Son. God has revealed Himself to us through His Son. You see, the second commandment is not only law, it's also prophecy. The second commandment is not only law, it's also prophecy. Think about it. Why would God prohibit his people from making images of him? And the answer is because he is preparing to send us his own image. God's people in the Old Testament surrounded in the ancient Near East by cultures who represented their God with physical, tangible idols. And they were commanded to have no images whatsoever. And they were to be totally alone in their world as the only people on earth who said, we worship a God who cannot be represented by any physical image. Why? To build anticipation. God is preparing his people and he is preparing the whole world around them for the most dramatic reveal in all of human history. Like, if you thought fixer-upper was cool, that's not a big deal. The second commandment is God setting the stage for the most dramatic reveal in all of human history. The incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ this is what we celebrate at Christmas every year, Advent. God sending to us his very own image. I love the way Paul says it in Colossians 1. He is the image of the invisible God. 
Colossians 2, Paul says, In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And the author of Hebrews chapter 1 says, He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. The one religion in all the earth that was commanded to have no images ends up having the clearest and the most beautiful image of God. How amazing is that? God has revealed himself in his word. God has revealed himself in his son, Jesus Christ. To keep the second commandment is to submit to God's revelation of himself. It's to say, rather than projecting upon God images of what we wish God was like, or what we supposed God was like, or what we thought God was like, we instead allow God to define himself and tell us what he is like in his word and in his son, Jesus. Which, by the way, it's not an accident that the Apostle John says, in the beginning was the word. And then later on, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why is Jesus the word? Because Jesus is God's fullest declaration and revelation of himself. Have you noticed that in Christian art, almost never is there a visual representation of the image of God. Michelangelo's creation of Adam is perhaps the only exception that I can think of. But even that, we understand it, that's meant to be somewhat artistic and symbolic. And yet Christian art is full of the Lord Jesus Christ, some better than others, I think we can all agree we've seen some pretty bad Jesus art, right? The, the Swedish Jesus, I like to call it, the blonde hair, blue-eyed Jesus. Jesus is probably not blue-eyed in North European. So it's unfortunate that some art has depicted him that way, but why is Christian art so comfortable painting pictures of Jesus? It's because Jesus was a real person. In Jesus, God took on flesh, so when we represent the Lord Jesus Christ in art, though we should do so reverently and carefully, we are following God's own revelation of himself. And this is why in Christian art, you almost never see representations of the Father and the Holy Spirit, but you see lots of representations of Jesus. Why is that? Because Jesus is God's own revelation of himself. He took on human form, and we know what a human looks like. So we can embrace that this is God's imaging of himself. It's appropriate for us to reflect that in art. God prohibits his people from making images of him because he has purposed to show forth the image of himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And here's the beautiful thing. It is in and through Jesus that we obey the second commandment. It's in Jesus and it's through Jesus that our worship is perfected and made complete. So if you've been paying attention at all, this is what your mind should be thinking at this point. Okay, so we're not allowed to have ideas and concepts of God that are ours and made up, but rather we're to submit to God's revelation of himself so what do I do with all these goofy images of God that I have? How do we get a fully accurate picture of what God is like? How do I make sure that I am worshiping God accurately and in accordance with who he is? I think that's a pretty serious question. Well, pastor and professor Dr. Ed Clowney, here's what he says. I think this is helpful. He says, may I speak a word of encouragement to you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ? If you have been a Christian for any length of time at all, you will realize that the farther you walk along the road of Christian maturity, the more you realize how desperate your own sin is. How can I ever truly worship God and annihilate the idolatry of my own heart, you will ask. Let me encourage you to realize that as you are in Christ, you are also worshiping God in Him. As you are in the Spirit, your worship is acceptable to God's sight. We come before the throne not for judgment, but for blessing. In Christ, God can accept your worship as perfectly pure and without idolatry. So do not hesitate to offer your Father in heaven the worship that is in your heart. In Christ, his perfect image is purified, made perfect, and is a pleasing aroma to God. Church, that is good news. So this morning...
God invites us to turn from all of our idols, all of our ways of making God into our own image, all of our ways of bringing him down to our level, all of our false concepts of him. And he invites us to turn from all of that and find ourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to his revelation of himself in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, to let our worship be perfected through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you this morning and we acknowledge your presence. We acknowledge your presence and we also acknowledge the amazing anticipation from Old Testament to thousands of years that would pass until the word would be made flesh and dwell among us as your son Jesus Christ who would go to the cross, who would die for our sin, who would take our place, who would take our punishment, who would give us the promise of forgiveness of sins, the hope of eternal life. We, we praise you for that. We praise you that your image is perfected and made complete in Jesus. And Lord, we also confess that our hearts have drifted from that. Forgive us for just misunderstanding who you are and trying to create our own image of who you are. Lord, if we're not worshiping the God of the Bible, we are worshiping a God of our own imagination. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, help us to keep our eyes focused on who you truly are. Help us to lean on others in the body of Christ for that kind of wisdom and discernment so we can think rightly and accurately of who you are, so that we can represent you truly and accurately to people who don't know you, so that we can at least help them to see the real God, whether they are open to following you or not, God. Help us to do these things in Jesus' name. Amen.